Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AKA Hotel Residences Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amarind Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Ocean First Bank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, Stonehenge NYC, SVN CPEX Real Estate Services, Tierra CRG, the Meringo Family Foundation, and these friends. One of the favorite topics of the New York Times over the last six months has been the topic of opportunity zones. So today I've assembled this group of individuals and professionals to provide their insight on what is an opportunity zone investment and the different alternatives. My guests today include John Lloyd, who is a member of the firm of CSG, Abe Schlissenfeld, who is the head of the real estate practice at Marks Paneth, Brendan Lakoff, who is a principal CEO of the Bell Point Companies, and last but not least, Abe Leitner, who is a director at Goulston & Stores. So since you're the accountant and you've been on the topic before, and this is the update, quickly explain what an opportunity zone investment is. In its simplistic uh, ex explanation, if you have a capital gain and you invest your funds into an opportunity zone, you can uh, A, get the benefit, assuming you invest in 2020, come 2026, you take off 10% of the gain and you only pay tax on 90% of your gain in 2026. But the real kicker is that if you hold your investment for at least 10 years, then you pay zero tax on the appreciation. So if you have a million dollar gain in, in 2020, uh, come 2026, you'll pay tax on the 900,000, however the tax rates aren't affected at that point. And then if you sell this uh, business or property for $10 million after 10 years, you pay zero tax on the appreciation. What happens that there's potential risk today that they want to change certain of the opportunity zones, Abe? Hey. So there have been a couple of bills introduced to peer back the zones that qualify for the incentive, including one that Senator Wyden introduced that would eliminate a substantial number of them and would actually be, a, be effective retroactively to the date that the bill was introduced. And at least for the zones that are affected, so for example, Long Island City uh, would be one, investors who are making an investment now really need to think twice so I think that brings up a good comment. This is a significant development, even though Amazon didn't go into Long Island City. A lot of new buildings are being built, a lot of rentals. It wouldn't be good for a condominium because the condominium doesn't go for that period of time over there. So somebody's investing in a building in Long Island City in a specific area that may be targeted, which is a good chance because it's right near the train, it's right near transportation, meets everything. If the legislation goes into effect, what's the tax of ramifications? the investor potentially wouldn't get the benefit uh, of the investment into that zone. So the choices would be either paying the tax or scrambling to redeploy the capital. So I'm going to look now at the, at the professionals over there. 
let's say that happens in certain neighborhoods. You're talking about you're doing business in Hackensack. In Hackensack, there's a question similar to Long Island City. Is it truly an area that needs an opportunity zone or it doesn't? What happens with that and what happens with the ramifications of the other taxes or the incentives that the community is trying to put into place? Hackensack is actually a really interesting case study because um, it, for a long time, the city looked like it had potential to become something like a Hoboken or a Jersey City on a much lower scale Be because of its housing stock, where it was located, the, the positioning of some of its multi-unit on, on, a, on, a, on a cliff actually had a lot of going for it. It lacked the kind of transportation uh, networking, et cetera, especially with the trains. There's a train line there, but it's not what you would typically refer to as a, an urban transit center. Politically, there was, there was a resistance to, by the, the town fathers and mothers, if you will, to stay away from incentives for a number of years. And finally, with a change of government there, a change of, of, change of political... Right, viewpoint. they were not user-friendly. They, they were not user-friendly. They stayed away from what is a very powerful tool in New Jersey, as is in other states, with local property taxation pilots, payments in lieu of taxation, tax abatements and redevelopment area bonds. Just when they turned and began to look to that three years ago, and opened up to the local incentives in conjunction with the state incentives, Hackensack began to turn. It took a canary in the mine case. It took one or two multi-unit residential projects to get off the ground with the local incentives. So let's say there were five or six in the last uh, two years that finally took, uh, took hold. The Opportunity Zone legislation that came into play as that was happening, the interesting dynamic in Hackensack is a couple of things have happened. For, for those, and, there, and you, Mike, you talked earlier about, I think there's three areas of the city. Um, I think they did a fairly good job of targeting where, where the zone was, ran down the Main Street corridor, uh, as well as um, the former Bergen Records site right on the river is in the zone. And that has re it received a lot of attention. But what the attention it's received is from some of the landowners there is they hear of this. They hear that there's now this opportunity for investors looking to take advantage of it. It has actually resulted in an acceleration of asking prices and market prices, which has, has actually gone a little bit to slow down some of the actual mm -hmm. trigger pulls on the transactions. But there's two or three pilot agreements that I'm familiar with that have uh, an, an uh, opportunity zone investor as part of the mix, if you will, in the capital stack. So I think Hackensack is an example of an area in New Jersey that will benefit once this equilibrium, I think, is reestablished on asking price. Because as, as we've been saying all along, this threshold determination of whether the investment makes sense. Hackensack has a very prominent medical center. Mm -hmm. Okay, part of the business in Hackensack could be a medical group, okay, or a dialysis <laughs> center being built as an operating business. Because as we were talking before, Brandon's company has make, part of the reasons for the Opportunity Zone was businesses besides real estate, as you were saying with a mattress company. Mm -hmm. So if somebody decides to build a auxiliary medical center or, or a facility tied into the large campus over there, they're creating a business, they're creating jobs, they're creating other things, which really is a qualifying. Let's talk about what you're doing both with the REIT and with regard to the operating businesses. You know, we're investing you know, in real estate, but we're also investing in, in private companies as well. Uh, there's some chemical companies and some startups and, and some, the mattress startup. Um, you know, we actually are moving our, our startup mattress company into an opportunity zone so we can grow that business and, and be able to raise more capital and be able to access that capital much easier through opportunity zones. Let's talk about you, the, the REIT that you took public in mm -hmm. December. Mm -hmm. So we're the first and only public, publicly traded opportunity zone structure. Um, right now we have a, just about $50 million, which is our filing and we're gonna be refiling with the, um, with the SEC to be able to increase it to two billion. Um, our structure is unique because you know, we're publicly traded, so if someone needs to exit early, they can, and not have to be you know, stuck into an, a real estate investment for, for 10 to 12 years, where our structure, you can, uh, you can exit you know, earlier. If you do exit earlier, you lose some of the opportunity zone benefits. What's the average investment in the, in the REIT? Um, around a quarter million dollars the average. And what are you seeing? Are you seeing any other structures like the REIT being created? No, that's pretty unique. Uh, most of what we're seeing is more traditional private equity type investments with <clears throat> friends and family investors or somewhat more widely, widely marketed funds for high net worth. What are you seeing? 
Yeah, so uh, seeing both the, the funds, the, the high net worth guys investing, um, but I'm seeing some of the real estate developers that, well, in the past they may have just used um, their own money, maybe some of the other people in the office, friends and family, they're now going out to the market to try to get some of that uh, high net worth so, money. So if somebody came to you saying, look, I sold my Apple stock, I paid $5 a share, <laughs> I made a quarter of a million dollars, or I made a million dollars. What do I do now? What do I do now? Right. Okay. So if, it's app, if they sold Apple stock, they can't do a 1031. But if they sell real estate, then we have the different options of discussing 1031s versus opportunity zone investments. Right. Um, what it means today, what it means in six years from now, what it means if just in case they reverse the rules, um, which, we, which won't happen with 1031s, although I don't think it's going to happen with opportunity zones. I don't think they're going to go retroactive. Um, and, then, and then we lay everything out, depending on their age, depending on their kids' ages. I mean, there's just so many variables. Right, but this is something that I said to Abe, the other Abe, before. Uh, what happens if, you, and I, I brought it up to Brandon also, what happens, you know, when you go into the real estate business, there are certain times there are contingencies to certain things that take place. You need additional capital. Okay, when you're an investor in a real estate deal, you know, you, you, you should be sophisticated to understand that there are good or bad times that you're over there. What happens in an opportunity zone if you de need additional capital for the project? Certain effects? So, you know, as we've been saying all along and will continue to say that uh, going into opportunity zone investment is no different than going to any other investment. You, you treat it as you would have gone to any other investment. And if the investment you would have gone into two years ago required capital calls down the road, you have to factor that into your business plan. Now, the fact is, if in two years down the road there's a capital call and you don't have any capital gain money at that point to put in, then you can still invest in it. It just won't be a qualified investment. And some of your uh, investment won't get the opportunity zone benefits. But you, if you go into any investment with the possibility of future capital calls, you have to be ready for that. How are the municipalities looking at these opportunities? It's, it's really interesting, Mike, because on the one hand, it, it's, um, it's another possible component to a deal that would otherwise not pencil out. But there's, a, there's also a little bit of counterintuitive uh, tension going on here. A municipality will typically evaluate an application for a pilot on, the, on, on an, uh, some fashion with a financial advisor for the municipality on a return analysis, return on cost or an internal rate of return over a particular holding period. If the sense is, what I've sensed from some municipalities is, is that you've got an opportunity zone component to your capital stack, there's already a benefit that exists to that, and there may actually counterintuitively be a bit of a pullback. So they'll, maybe redu they'll reduce the pilot exactly. possibility. And so this is saying a, that there's too many incentives going on. Right, the and this is the catch-22 with it, and that that goes back to this threshold determination of is this likely to appreciate over the holding period? We in New Jersey right now too, as well, uh, an investor will look at the whole array of of potential uh, incentives, and our state incentive program right now is in a bit of a freeze pattern because the, the two very powerful programs, the ERG and uh, NJ Grow, are, are, have expired. The legislature and the governor's office are in active negotiations on the five, five program replacement. When that gets into place, it's the kind of thing I think that when it comes back around and is integrated, you know, may lead uh, opportunity zone investors to be attracted. Then concomitantly though, the municipalities will say, well, that's another reason why you don't need as much. So, there's, there's that a, bit, a little bit of a catch-22 that we're seeing with it. Have you seen that? No, we, we haven't seen it yet, but we haven't done any programs, any other programs, and we haven't done anything uh, in Jersey. But, you, but you're saying you're doing something in Connecticut. There are certain areas of Connecticut where, you, where there are other incentive programs available. C Connecticut doesn't have a lot of uh, incentive programs. So mm -hmm. what they do is they, um, instead of giving you tax breaks, they'll give you uh, bonuses, mm -hmm. more density, more square footage, um, relax some other rules to be able to allow you to build bigger projects and, and right but those incentives are worthwhile anyway because you're gonna get density more apartments more height and other situations. But, but that's how they justify by not giving you tax dollars Abe who's coming to you which your clients what are you trying to in, in general do for your clients today with regard to opportunity zones and most of my clients are one of two types either people who own properties in qualified opportunity zones and are trying to capitalize on the regime. And there are structures that actually allow existing owners to do that through leasing their property to another entity. So explain that, because that's, that, that's a very interesting, especially since you own the asset beforehand. Mm. 
Right. So when the rules were set up initially, the idea was that it would attract capital from buyers. And in order to qualify, a property can't have been owned by the fund before the effective date of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But as the regulations were issued, they actually allowed a fund to lease property from the owner. And a, a fund that's leasing property can qualify even if the property was owned by the owner before the effective date. Moreover, they also allowed leases from related owners as well. So we're seeing some structures where an owner of property can set up a new vehicle which will lease the property from the existing But aren't entity. there different tax ramifications if the property is being leased? Well, the idea is that the, the tenant well, on the the asset. will then develop the property, hold it for 10 years, operate it, and then sell the leasehold position. But let, let's look at it this way. Somebody's owned the property. They started construction on a, an XYZ property. It doesn't matter what they did. Now they're leasing the property. There's a difference between fee ownership and a lease. Certain people don't want to be involved with a lease. How would you recommend that to your client? I know, honestly, it's really all depending on where you are in the development stage because there, you know, there are ways to get around the leasing if it's right before CO, et cetera. Um, I, I assume, Abe, you're referring to usually when it's pre-development, that's when the Correct. leasing goes on. Correct. Because that, that's really, the, when, when it's mid-development, uh, it's really hard to get a structure in place to make, to make it work completely. Mm -hmm. It's either at the pre-development or when you're towards the end, and that's where um, the leasing really comes into play. A lot of people like the lease structure? The lease structure is attractive to existing owners. The, the only other way for an existing owner to take advantage of the regime is to sell to a new fund and potentially capture some premium for being in the zone, but I think it's pretty speculative in terms of what the price difference actually right. is and, in the market. And they're only allowed to retain 20% of the asset if right. they... Correct, if they stay in the deal. There are also restrictions on reinvesting the gain back into the fund and getting the benefit of the deferral, which potentially don't allow you to benefit unless you have other gains that you're rolling into. The what, fund. what about the estate tax ramifications of investing in Opportunity Zone? I mean, with yours, you don't have a problem because you have instant liquidity. Mm -hmm. It's a traded stock that you can, you can pull out on a daily well, basis. Well, you have a mark to market, so you know what the, the value of the stock is. So right. if you have an estate, you know, if you had an estate issue before and you're going to have an estate issue after. It's no different than any other investment. Yeah. Um, when, the, when the law was initially passed, there was a lot of uh, ambiguity as to whether or not some of the benefits would carry over to the estate. Some of the regulations have taken care of that and uh, the, the benefits do pass on to the heirs. So it's, it's, in all reality, it's no different than any other so real estate investment. Here's the question. Why, why was the New York Times so adamant in picking on the negatives of the opportunity zones as opposed to the positives? I think what it really is, is, is they see the rich getting richer yeah. using tax benefits. And I think that's why New York Times doesn't like um, what's going on with opportunity zones. They see wealthy Americans, wealthy developers who are, who are building projects using, using these tax benefits. They're looking at it that way, but they're not also looking at the regular investor who may have had money in the market and who's had a gain, who can defer the gain to a later period now. They're viewing that as another benefit for the rich. <laughs> I, I, I think they're just looking at it as, as this is you know, more, it's more Republican versus Democrat. And I think you have to really look at the different census tracts and what's really going on in different census tracts. There's, there's census tracts that, that are controlled by Democrats that are getting benefits and no one's, people are overlooking that. They're looking at the, the yachts in, in West Palm Beach. Um, not looking at what's going on in Michigan or, or other states. The, the biggest shame is, and I don't want to turn this into a C-SPAN show, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, this, this was obviously passed by a Republican president, uh, and it's getting a lot of the, the negativity that you're talking about. But in reality, this, this, this bill was introduced, it was a bipartisan bill that was introduced right. years ago. Cory and, Booker, and, right, former yep. mayor, former mayor Booker, of New York. Sean Parker. He's, Sean Parker. He's, he's a Democrat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, it, it's really a shame that it's getting the hit job. Right, but, it I, is. but I think, you know, getting back to Abe Leitner, I, I believe that they are going to change some of the zones because certain of the markets. A, a, a few. I, I, think, I think you might see a few change because there's certain census tracts that shouldn't even be qualified as an opportunity zone. I think those should be changed. Mm. But the vast majority deserve the opportunity zone tax benefits and, and are getting it. And it's, very, it's really very hard although not impossible, the government can do what they want, but it's hard to go retroactive for the simple reason that when, when people go into a business deal, 
they need to know what the playing field is. And, and when you have a certain playing field in front of you and then you change the rules two years later, I mean, it's really not, not right to the business community. It, and it's not right to you, the, to you the local... You, you weren't born in 1986 when they had the Tax Reform Act of 1986 and they changed the entire real estate mm -hmm. world upside down. But going forward... They, they, they changed it for the worst, yeah. okay? I know, but... The depreciation. But not retroactive. But not retroactive. Not retroactive. Not, not correct. But basically, you know, you don't know what's going to no, happen over the... 100%. And, and there could be change, but the question is, the change going to be retroactive or going forward? Yeah. I, I just want to highlight one other thing about going forward and risks, et cetera, related to opportunity zones. Remember, in 2026, you're paying tax at the, at the rates that are mm -hmm. currently in effect. I mean, it's right in now. Current, we're, currently, in effect, the, in, 20, 2026. in 2026. 2026. Right. So, so right. you have a change in presidents. You have a change in Kyle, the House and Congress. You, you we go from, anything. We go from 20 percent yeah. capital gains rates to 30 or 35. Or Bloomberg whatever. said 44. 44. Right. I mean, just think about what that's. Right. You, you know. Well, right. But so, so how do you how do you combat that problem? Well, if you have a publicly traded structure, and the tax rates are going to change, our structure you can exit, you can exit early. I know you were early in the game on this. Mm -hmm. Do you see any other companies creating the REIT structure today? Uh, there's Skybridge. Uh, there's a couple others out there. Um, you know, so there hasn't been that many. Um, but the difference is, is those are private REITs. We're more or less like a private equity fund. We're a publicly traded company. So it's, we're the only publicly traded uh, opportunity right. zone structure out there. Yeah, the, the, the very interesting structure that they have. Keep in mind also, a lot of the uh, baby REITs that are out there in, in general, um, the, the, a lot of their purpose is to shield uh, foreign money or triple tax-free money from real estate investments and the taxability. The opportunity zone world is not attracting those types of investors because they don't get the tax benefits. So it's not, uh, it's not as used common vehicle uh, in the opportunity zone world uh, bell points really come up with an interesting structure. And, and, I, don't, and I think the regulations don't need to change. I mean, maybe a couple of census tracts, but after 2021, the, your, um, your deferral is going to be less than five years, and you don't have a reduction of your old capital gain. It's going to be less attractive, so you're going to see less capital coming in. We, we were talking before about Brookfield and other companies in that similar vein, you know, who are large owners. What are they investing in? You, you, you were bringing out the fact yeah, but, but, that they invested in two multifamily, correct. one shopping center. Uh, it's one uh, mall, a uh, brand new built mall. It was, when they bought it from... Um, Forest GG, City? For, no, it was actually GGC, GGP. GGP. Uh, they, uh, it was pretty much almost built. Uh, so it was a way for them to, to liquidate some of their capital in those deals. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's non-leveraged deal, so they're just using all equity, about a billion dollars of equity. And those three deals, and uh, you and know. who, and who's raising the money for them? Is it the it's wirehouses? The wirehouses, all the big wirehouses. Is it a mall that is in transition? It's a brand new mall. My concern is that they're building for less than a five percent yield, mm -hmm. so it's not a high yielding deal. Any of the other larges, large uh, companies? Some of the other large ones, and you know, obviously we all know about RXRs that they're doing. Some of the other large outfits. Um, what is interesting about the. Uh, the business side of the Opportunity Zone deals with some of the funds we're doing and maybe not as much now that interest hasn't been as strong as originally anticipated is uh, uh, putting in more equity than debt than they would have normally in the past to try to capture some of that Opportunity Zone money mm -hmm. and then with the plan that in future deals down the road they would maybe take out a little bit How more How about your, your clients today? How Both Abe and Abe on this. Are you seeing a number of your clients who used to go to Ferns and Family going more on different type of investors today for Opportunity Zones? So yeah, I, I see them trying to go out. Uh, some have been successful. Uh, it's really been a, a long, hard process of educating the public on what an Opportunity Zone is, um, what the benefits are, what the benefits are. And some people think like you, you don't pay tax on anything. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the public uh, perception of Opportunity Zones runs from here to here. Um, the New York Times obviously has their thoughts on it, but then you read some of the trade magazines and they're touting it like it's the best thing since sliced bread. So, but right. it's really and, about and, and, you know, and I think it relates, you know, when, when I would put in the word opportunity zone in, in Google, you'd see so many ads, you know, Google ads for companies who are tr trying to hype and trying to sell this. And certain people are saying that they're opportunity zone experts. So how, do, how does someone qualify to be an opportunity zone expert. That's my big question over there. Don't believe that. Mm -hmm. No, I'm serious. It's, it, as we, as yeah. we keep on saying, if, if they were a good developer and a good business operator prior right. to the Tax Act, 
then that should carry Now, on. do you see any of the regular REITs doing this? They, they, they can't because 90 percent of your... It your, has to be passed through. Ha, no, 90 percent of your assets be. have to be in opportunity zones. Yeah. But what if you have a REIT who wants to create a new REIT structure, a new, they want to do a new IPO for a REIT? Take a, one of the large REITs for, let's say, Vernado, which spun off the urban edge over there. Right. But again, that goes back to what I said before. A lot of the money that's coming into these public REITs are institutional money. And, and institutional money, um, for the large part, does not get the tax benefits of opportunities. It is mostly high net worth, sophisticated investors. I, I had an interesting experience. So a client sold a property and a syndicated deal that had a number of investors. And they found a, a new deal in a qualified opportunity zone to roll the money into and defer the gain. And they brought the deal to their investors. And it turned out that the only investor who was willing to roll over was the uh, wealthiest of the group who had about 70% of the original deal. All the smaller investors. All the, all the other ones in. wanted out. It was I just mean, too much. I, I think you know, a great example about that would be the same situation that with, happened with the Empire State Realty. Okay, there were a number of investors who were small investors, and when Tony Malcolm wanted to put everybody into a, a REIT, a regular REIT, because they were a private REIT, a lot of people said, oh, I don't want it. I like the stock dividend that I got, that in essence would have been better if they went into the Empire State REIT. So the apple looks still bright, but I think you have to understand the ramifications and you have to talk to tax professionals. I'd like to thank John, Abe, Brandon, and Abe, and I'll see you next week.